welcome Alan Jones. All right, everybody stretch out a hand to Alan. We'll pray and get started. Jesus, I thank you so much for Alan. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would come right now and just fill him up. Yeah, anywhere that he feels empty, just overflow him with your goodness and your love. In Jesus' name, amen. How's everyone doing? Uh, I wonder if you can be very gracious to me this evening. Uh, my wife, who's in that picture, who looks wonderful. <laughs> I, really think, I just hate those church pictures where there's, there's no normal situation where we ever look like that. <laughs> what am I, like a, a human reclining chair? <laughs> if that were to be true, she's like two feet taller than me and is just leaning over. Anyway, my wife, bless her, was due to be speaking tonight, uh, but she's had the a uh, real problem with her neck today. So she went to see her chiropractor and her C4 had rotated and he adjusted her, but then uh, throughout the course of the day, she just got worse and worse and worse. So I looked at her and said, honey, why don't you just go home? And I said, now I'll preach. <laughs> that's, that's what you call your mouth moving faster than your brain. <laughs> and she's like, yes, but it's seven, you know, it's, no, what time is it now? Yeah, it was eight o'clock. And she said, well, what are you going to speak on? I was like, I don't know. The Holy Spirit will give me something to speak. So she started crying. And she's like, you're so wonderful and sweet and sensitive. I was like, remember this, okay? <laughs> remember this moment. Uh, so she's gone home, bless her. And I'm going to speak. But normally, I like to have a lot more time to prepare to speak than half an hour. So if this sucks, okay, <laughs> next time you see AJ, just say, I should have prayed that your neck was healed. <laughs> hey, before we jump into what we're going to speak on tonight, I... I uh, wanted to let you in on a little thing that we're doing at Grace Center. Uh, this kind of came up last minute. How many of you were at Grace Center a couple of Sundays ago, I think two Sundays ago, and we talked a little bit, shared a little bit about what's going on around the world. We talked a little bit about the problems in Iraq, uh, the persecution that a lot of um, minorities and uh, especially Christians and uh, some other religious groups are under huge persecution, uh, a real slaughter and genocide in many ways. And so we brought that to light. Our church took up a massive offering. You can still give towards that if you'd like. We're going to send that over to uh, one of the pastors that we know in the area. But as we were praying and thinking about it as a leadership team for the church, we thought, you know, we really want to just call our church to a fast for a three-day fast. Now, don't be scared. Um, but that's what we're going to be doing. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we're going to be fasting. I'll explain about the, the fast later on. But uh, I wanted to let you know, if you are uh, consider Grace in your home church or you have a real passion for what's going on and you'd like to join us in a fast, we as a church are going to be fasting for the next three days. Uh, on the Wednesday night, we'll be meeting in here to pray and to intercede. And it's not just for Iraq. We're also praying for the Middle East. We're praying for, uh, you know, you can pray for whatever you want. But in terms of our focus as a church, we're praying for what's going on in the Middle East. And, the, um, and we're praying for what's going on in Iraq. And we're praying, uh, yes, for Israel. Um, isn't Israel in the Middle East? Or I am not strong on geography or world politics, so I should probably stop talking right now. All right. Very good. Um, this is another exciting thing. If you go to the Grace Center website tonight when you get home, you see down the bottom in that little red box, it just says latest church news, and it says jobs at Grace Center. We, and I'm super excited about this. If, I think if I wasn't uh, already doing this job, I'd probably apply for this job because it's straight up my street. We're looking for a director. Everybody say, ooh. We're looking for a director of technical ministries. How awesome is that? We need somebody who is going to pastor all the technical stuff in our church. Um, let me read this because I wrote it and it's brilliant. The director of technical ministries is a full-time position that will support and inspire the ministries of Grace Center. We're looking for a person to raise up a team of servant leaders who are geniuses in the realm of IT and AV technologies. The successful candidate will have strong leadership skills and can demonstrate vision, a heart of excellence, and a passion for the innovative and effective use of audio, visual, and computing technologies in ministries. You will be a powerful communicator who can manage themselves well and lead others with grace and wisdom. If you have extensive experience in AV production and IT network and have a proven track record, proven or proven track record for leading others and working well, um, 
uh, with diverse technologies and personalities, then we want to hear from you. So if you know anybody who's an uber nerd who loves uh, sound and video and lights and computers, then send them over there. They can uh, register their interest and uh, we'd love to have you join our growing team who are absolutely amazing and absolutely awesome. I love working at Gray Center. Do you know that? It's absolutely, I'm sure, sometimes I think, is this even legal, the amount of fun we have? It's, it's absolutely absurd and uh, awesome. Hey, I think, not last time I was speaking because that was last week, but about eight weeks ago uh, when we were speaking, I mentioned that we'd launched a podcast. But I'm still amazed how many people I bumped into. We're like, oh, I just found your podcast. And we're like, we're like 14 episodes in. Uh, but if you didn't know, we have a podcast. If you want to go to alanandaj.com this week, uh, we're talking all about dating. Uh, I got so many people texted me last week. Somebody wrote an article on Facebook, and we discussed this article. And it was so hard to be on my best behavior, but I think I did a great job at <laughs> being good and polite. I did, thank you. Okay, I appreciate that. All right, look at your neighbor and say, this is going to be awesome. All right. Now, neighbors, don't hit them when you see what tonight's topic is. Tonight, I'd like to talk to you about, about fasting. <laughs> I, I have a love-hate relationship with fasting. Mostly, I love to hate fasting. Because <laughs> I really like food. I really, I really like food. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story about how I ended up fasting, which was purely accidental. Because nobody in their right mind would go, you know what I want to do today is not eat. That would be awesome. Actually, people... Stop right there. Um, it's very, very important to me that as you hear me talk a little bit about fasting tonight, that you do not go away with a message or a residue in your heart that in order to be loved by God, you have to fast. That's ludicrous. Let me say it this way. If you were to do, and purpose in your heart to do absolutely nothing for God for the rest of your days, would not change his heart towards you. His love for you is not conditional. It's the best news in the world. So <clears throat> That's why, you know, I meet people who say, you know, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. I don't need to tithe to be a Christian. I don't need to, you know, do this, that, the next thing. I'm like, you're absolutely right. You, you really don't. Your um, efforts, your discipline, your obedience, whatever, will not shift God's love for you because he already loves you as much as he can love you. He is love and his heart is for you. and He's never going to be against you. He thinks you're amazing and you're absolutely wonderful. But wouldn't it be sad to receive all this love from God and never let it change you? So somewhere in our brokenness, we think the God, the stuff that God's trying to get us to do really sneaky in the Bible is about kind of eroding our fun or our whatever. But it's the absolute opposite. He's just like, hey, no, 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 seriously. If you just come over here and if you just stand here, a bucket of awesomeness will be poured on your head. And we're like, I don't trust you. I don't think I want to go over there. You're probably going to make me do something. No, 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 no. If you just stand still, I'll, I'll, I'll bless you. I want to not miss out on anything God's doing in my life. And I've learned that Jehovah Sneaky does not do things the way I would do things. So he says, give and it will be given to you. And you're like, that sounds sneaky. <laughs> How about it will be given to me and then I will give? Sounds much better. He says, hey, if you die, you will live. Ah, Mr. Logic, you may have a problem. And so there's a whole lot of stuff in Scripture that if we look at it from the wrong perspective, we get really suspicious and we really get sketchy and we really think, God, what are you up to? And for me, fasting was one of those things. Maturity, I have found, comes from doing really, really simple things. That's just walking with God and agreeing with what his word says. So I feel about as welcome as a fart in a spacesuit tonight. So if you guys could just trust me on this, it's going to be a good night. All right. If you've got your Bibles with you, turn with me to Matthew 6, please. Do I have water? I do. Holy Spirit, would you help me? Amen. All right, how many of you would like some good news? Yeah. All right, Matthew 6. This is Jesus, and he's speaking to his followers, and he's giving them a heads up, and he's actually comparing his way of life with the religious order of the day. So he's actually just saying, hey, pretty much like us, hey guys, you've seen these people do this stuff, 
And I know what you're thinking, you don't really like it, it looks really arrogant, and I kind of agree with you. But don't be confused with what they're doing, it's their heart that's wrong, not what they're doing. He's just trying to kind of uh, sift motives from action. So Matthew 6, verse 1, he says, watch out, don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they have received all the reward they will ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private, and your Father who sees everything will reward you. Huh. All right. So Jesus is an expectation that giving isn't the problem. It's actually the motive or the intent or why you're giving. He's like, so if you're going to do it, do it in secret and just watch what my heavenly Father will do. Verse 5, he says, when you pray, don't be like hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that's all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you and pray to your Father in private then your Father who sees everything will reward you. Verse 16, And when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do, for they try to look miserable and disheveled so people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth, that is the only reward they will ever get. But when you fast, comb your hair. That would be novel for some of us in here. Um, and wash your face, then no one will notice that you are fasting except your Father who knows what you do in private. And your Father who sees everything will reward you. My point in reading that passage is simply, Jesus had an expectation that his followers would just do a bunch of stuff. In particular, he was thinking, yeah, my followers are going to give, obviously. You know, I'm a giver, my father's a giver. Once you join the family, giving is contagious. And the expectation that would happen. He also had an expectation that we would be praying. And shockingly enough, he had an expectation that we would be fasting. Wait, what? I did not discover fasting probably till I was in my mid-twenties. And I've been in my church. I've been in the church my whole life. The best sermon I'd ever heard up until that point on fasting was somebody who had to preach on Matthew 6. And I just appreciated his honesty because he just said, I can talk to you about giving and I can talk to you about praying, but actually when I read this passage, I realized I'm in my 50s and I've never fasted, so I can't comment on it. And I was like, bravo. Like, bravo, but it got me thinking. Well, I say it got me thinking, I just like, that's one of those obscure passages that we won't look at. And I honestly forgot about it. I really paid no attention to it. However, two things I want to point out. First thing is, Jesus had an expectation it would just be a normal part of life as a disciple. The second thing, and I hope you noticed that, that he talked about rewards. That's exciting. Verse 3, when you give to someone in need, give your gifts in private, and your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. There is a reward when you give away. I don't know if you remember this at the start of the year. I'm doing this experiment where for the whole year I'm tracking. Does anyone remember my obsessive compulsive thing? I'm still tracking it. It's ridiculous. I've stopped telling people because people get upset. Really, it's just outrageous. But what something happens when you give in private, God rewards you most often publicly. And I'm trying to get accustomed to wearing the blessings of God. Because it's ridiculous. You just... You know, this is now what we started thinking. Well, I need this money. Okay, well, then the simplest way to get that money is to give some stuff away. And then it falls on you. So there's a principle. We'll talk about that principle in a second. Verse 6, when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father who sees everything will reward you. Well, what's the reward for prayer? I think there's a ton of rewards for prayer. I think in James, for years... I used to wonder how I could get close to God. And then Jack Deere in his book just one day quoted James. He didn't even make it up. He just quoted straight out of the Bible. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. <gasps> the way you get more of God is just go near him. And he meets you. And so I tell you, anybody you envy who's got an incredible relationship with God, I guarantee you they've spent time with God. 
I had a dream a number of years ago, and in the dream, the Lord said to me, Alan, many come for salvation, few stay for relationship. And that's the truth. And you know, he's so gracious and he's so giving that he'll give salvation to whoever would want it. It's his heart's desire, he'd be in intimate relationship with everyone, but through our own hearts or our brokenness, we, sometimes we stop short of the ground floor of salvation, and I don't mean that as a demeaning work of salvation. But it's the elevator through which you enter that takes you up into the heavenlies, quite literally. And you just can encounter incredible things through God. And then verse 17, when you fast, comb your hair and wash your face. Then no one will notice that you are fasting except your Father who knows what you do in private and your Father who sees everything will reward you. So wait a minute, there's rewards from fasting. <clears throat> that shouldn't come as a huge surprise to any of us. The verse I probably quote most often is the whole law of sowing and reaping. Whatever you sow, you reap. And found in Galatians 6 verse 7. Let me read the following verses to that. Galatians 6 verse 8 says, those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. Woo! Decay and death! Doesn't sound good. In the NIV it says, to those who sow to the flesh will reap from the flesh. So if you just sow to just fleshly behavior, you just reap the rewards that come from that. I'm 100 pounds heavier than I should be because I've been sowing into Toblerone and to chips and to tacos. And I've reaped it, right? I have, you know, I had a friend when I was in school and uh, he was training for the, I guess he was training for the Olympic team, but he was training for the, uh, he was a swimmer. So every morning before he'd get up to school, he'd been in the pool, I don't know how many miles he'd, he'd swam, but he had a swimmer's physique. So when it come time to PE, you know, and we're all like these gangly, like, 14 year olds, some who've gone through puberty, some who haven't, and our voices are everywhere. He just come out of, you know, just ka -ching, triangle, you know, and he's swimming and he's well built, and you're like, God, how come he has that body and I've got this body? Well, it's not that like God gave him that body and I have this body. He gets up every morning and swims miles and miles and miles. He's sown and he's reaped. It goes on, it says, Those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. Anytime you want an upgrade in your walk with God, just invest into the Spirit. Just sow towards godly things. This is amazing. It's not rocket science. Just follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Just do what he did, and you'll get what he had. Verse 9, let's not get tired of doing what is good. There is a word in season for many people tonight. Do not get tired of doing what is good. Sometimes doing what is good sucks. <laughs> We're about to take away our leaders this weekend and do a leaders retreat, and I was flicking through my notes and in preparation for it, and I read this line that I said, I was talking about being in leadership. And I said, part of the call of being in leadership is that you are so full of the love of God that you have a, enough to absorb the blows from the people that you're leading. Normal life is, you hurt me, I'll hurt you back. But when you're in leadership, especially Christian leadership, when people lash out and hurt you, it's an expectation from the Father that you have a reservoir that they perhaps aren't aware of. You have this reservoir of the Father's love so you can accommodate their hurt, their woundedness, their immaturity, and respond in love, not, oh yeah. But that gets wearisome. Do you know how many people I want to slap on a daily basis? <laughs> I'm just like, uh-huh, mm -hmm. Father loves you, mm-hmm. And sometimes I run out. Sometimes I, that's my contemplator. I just needs to go back and just be with the Father. Just to follow, would you fill me up so I don't slap the people that you love? <laughs> but sometimes doing good gets weary. Otherwise, you wouldn't need that verse. It says, at just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. So fasting fits into that principle. That makes sense? Is everybody okay? Somebody remind me to come back to Second Peter. <clears throat> There's a bunch of principles in Scripture in the kingdom that really make no sense. We've talked about them already, that you die to live, that you give and it will be given to you. And, uh, you know, you get slapped and you turn the other cheek. and You know, all these things that just don't make any sense. And here's another one. Yes, you are rewarded, but you don't actually earn it. 
You're rewarded whenever you sow to the Spirit, but it's not something that you earn. And the issue of fasting, I'm amazed at the return on investment that you get. If you think about it, your return on investment is to do nothing. <laughs> when you fast, you do nothing. You literally do nothing. You don't do anything. That's the point of fasting. You don't eat. And you're like, how does this work? How does not eating change stuff? I don't know. But it does. So you do nothing and stuff happens. Fasting doesn't earn you anything, but it does position you to receive something. In the same way, I can go home on a Thursday night and think, Ah, oh, I could go spend some time with the Holy Spirit, but no, you know what? American Ninja Warrior is on, so I'm going to go over there. I've got nothing against American Ninja Warrior. I love American Ninja Warrior. But if I spend two hours watching American Ninja Warrior, I'm going to reap entertainment, and that's awesome. If instead, on the Friday night, I come home and think, I could spend time with God, or I could watch reruns of American Ninja Warrior, but I decide to go be with God, the two hours I spend with God there, I'm going to get something. I didn't earn it. I just positioned myself for it. It was there on Thursday night. I just didn't decide to get it. That makes sense. Um, yeah. I can't think of another way of saying that. Let me talk to you about my story of how I ended up fasting. I ended up fasting completely accidentally because, as I said, nobody in their right mind would choose to not eat the delicious food that's available. But when I was, I forget how old I was, mid-20s, I read this book, Surprised by the Voice of God, and I was astonished that people could hear the voice of God. I didn't even think it was real. So I just started praying, God, I really want to hear your voice. And I believe that you speak, but I've never heard your voice, and I really want to learn to hear your voice, so would you speak to me? Do you know when I prayed that, the only thing I heard was, fast. I heard one word was fast. I was like, this sucks. This thing's broken. Try again. Fast. And again, you know, and I thought at that point, well, okay, in my childlike faith, I'm asking to hear from you. So I can either just ignore it. I can either not fast and not hear, or I can decide that maybe that is you and I'll start fasting. So I started fasting and I did it all wrong because I didn't know anybody who fasted. So I just thought, oh, well, this would be a smart idea. And I'll teach you how to fast well later. But I started fasting and I, I was like, okay, that's interesting. And I don't think I drew the parallel until later. But I realized that as I was fasting, and by the way, you know, I would fast on uh, Tuesday. That would be my day that I would fast. I'd fast on Tuesday. Tuesday was miserable. I didn't really feel anything. And I wouldn't say that Wednesday, well, Wednesday was awesome because you could eat. Never did a bowl of cornflakes toast, taste so glorious. <laughs> Father, I give you praise. <laughs> <laughs> but <clears throat> I would say that there was a marked increase in my ability to hear God's voice. And again, I don't think that was a well done, you have earned one fasting token, here is one hearing God's voice token. But what I think it did do was push pause on the internal noise of my life. It just simplified things a little bit more. And I wouldn't say honestly, hand on heart, that concurrently, that as I was fasting, I was realizing I was hearing God. I would say it was only in hindsight. Jeff Dollar says it this way. He said, when you're taking vitamins, you don't really notice it. Like when you're taking vitamins every day, you don't really notice it. When you stop taking vitamins, a couple of days after you stop, then you notice. And I would say that's a pretty good example. There's uh, something happens to your spirit. That there's, I don't know if it's a dullness when you don't, but it's, it's remar remarkable. Now, here's what I will say and what I've learned is the days that God asked me to fast were way easier to fast than the days that I thought, I think I'll fast. And I said, you know, tell me about Second Peter. Uh, where is it? Second Peter 1 verse 2 says, May God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. What that means is, if you'd never heard about fasting or even thought about fasting before you came here tonight, there probably wasn't grace for fasting. But now that you have grown more in your knowledge of God and of Jesus Lord, now that you've just heard me say that, hey, Jesus is an expectation that has followed, grace comes with that to obey. So previously you weren't empowered to do it. Now you get empowered. You just say, Jesus, would you give me grace to do this? 
So I remember, you know, I remember I'd just kind of wake up and every Tuesday I'd just be like, uh, am I, is this a fasting day? Is this a uh -huh day or is this a woohoo day? And there was a season in my life where I would just be fasting every Tuesday. It just, I just kind of really got. And then I remember one Wednesday I woke up and I was like, oh, I'm so glad. I'm the biggest bowl of cornflakes ever and just cake it in sugar and it's going to be awesome. And as I was about to do that, I felt the Lord said, would you fast again? I'm like, are you, are you even serious? Two days, this is insane. And I remember the Lord fasted 40 days. I was like, two days is fine, no problem. <clears throat> and so I learned about this process and this principle of fasting. And I noticed that while I wasn't doing anything, simultaneously, there were other areas of my life that were accelerating. And what was interesting is all the stuff I tried to achieve, godliness and holiness and humility and dreams and visions and power, which you, you can't kind of manufacture up. You can't buy a potion. Well, you probably could, but you don't want those potions. <laughs> I realized that started growing, and I thought, gosh, Lord, there seems to be a parallel and a principle that's happening. I'm going to speak personally here. Personally for me, the biggest... Okay, I'm, I'm going to let you down here. I'm, I'm going to build this up, and then when I show you what it is, you're going to be like, really? But let me back up a bit. The greatest reward for Alan Jones personally in fasting is achieving humility. Right? Doesn't seem like an awesome gift. Woohoo! You've won $100 of humility. <laughs> like, what is humility? It's this intangible thing. I have learned that humility is such a big deal to God. And the trouble is, for many, many years, I didn't really see a need for humility because I'm pretty awesome. And the God's like, and that's the problem. You're so impressed with yourself, there's no room for me. Wait, what? James 4, verse 6 says this, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And last week when I was teaching, I, w I would ask, I asked the question, you know, what if your normal is not normal? What if your definition of humility isn't the same as God's? I think we all like to think we're the right amount of humble. Well, I mean, I'm not excessive in the humility department. I'm not like a Mother Teresa, but she was a little bit, you know, I'm the right amount of humility. In fact, I'm very proud of my humility. <laughs> How many of you would love to be opposed by God? Hey, Father, I'd love your help. I'm sorry I'm opposing you today. Really, that's not very Christ-like. Well, it just says here, James 4, verse 6, he poses the proud. How many of you love hanging out with arrogant people? How many of you love spending time with people who think they know more about a topic than you do, except you've gone to school for it for five years, and they read a column about it in an article, not even an article, on like BuzzFeed, and so now they're suddenly an expert on this topic, and you're like, yeah, that, that's, that's not true. And they're like, ah, oh, what do you know? And you're like, ah, oh, I have five years of you know, med school to tell you that's not true. You don't like being around those people. I have a member in my family that literally, every time I see her, she's got a PhD in something new, in her own head. She's a legend in her own, <laughs> in her own mind, you know? And I've seen her argue with professionals. I've seen her argue with doctors and with lawyers about things that you're like, what, what are you talking about? And that's not a nice person to be around. And so that's what happens when pride reaches in our heart. The difficulty, is very, the difficulty comes that it's very hard to assess whether pride's there or not. Because if you're really, really proudful, you can justify why you feel the way you feel. How many of you would love to be honored and lifted up and exalted by God? I mean, that's not a bad thing. That's, you know, I pray for that all the time. I ask, Lord... If somebody's going to have influence in this world, I'd like it to be me. Seriously, if you're handing out influence, I'd, I'd like some influence. If you're handing out honor, I would love some honor. Like, uh, in all honesty, if, if you're giving it, I would like it. Luke 18, verse 14. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. I've tried it both ways. I've been humbled by God. That's not pleasant. And then I've obeyed God where it says, humble yourself. You know, I forgot to look this up how many times in Scripture it says to humble ourselves. What's your practical steps for humbling yourself? Like, what do you pray over yourself? The opposite of I smart, I kind, I wonderful. Like, what's the opposite of that? To be humble. <laughs> but it clearly says whoever humbles himself will be exalted. 
Jesus said, Matthew 18, verse 4, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> the Lord himself, listen to this, this is Isaiah 66, verse 2. This is what the Lord says. This is the one whom I esteem. How would you like God as a reference on your resume? You know, he's saying, this is who I esteem. If you're asking my opinion of who I really, really value and who I esteem, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and who trembles at my word, has an honor and a value for my word. Sometimes I have these fleeting revelations. There's a couple of people in my life who I love, I really do, but on a bad day, I tolerate them. Now, I love them, I really do, and I love them, but you know, when I'm busy and I've got stuff to do, they're kind of a mere distraction. Am I sounding horrible? I'm just being honest. And I remember one day kind of being frustrated that like this person was in the way of me completing my task, and the Lord was like, actually, Alan, I know that you disdain that and you wish they were more organized or more efficient, but actually, I wish you were more like that. And you're like, you, you do? He's like, yeah, I really value that. Like, that's something I really value. And I was like, God, I got it upside down. I've missed it. <clears throat> if you need revelation for your life, Psalm 25 verse 9 says, God guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. When I was looking for a reason to fast or to understand why God was having me do so much fasting, I came across this verse in Psalm 35, verse 13. And for me, just personally speaking, the reason that I love to fast is I know I'm a man who struggles with pride and the fastest way to humility is through fasting. Psalm 35, verse 13 says, I humbled myself with fasting. Fasting, no pun intended, is the fastest way I know to produce humility in your life. Now, there are, if I prepared this properly, I could give you like six or seven reasons in Scripture why the people of God fast. For me, privately and personally, I love the fruit of humility that comes from it. Because you know why? I'm amazed how a efficient, educated, articulate, intelligent, fairly well put together, has goals, has vision, knows what he's talking about, is well prepared on any given day, that's me by the way, can be reduced to absolute uselessness by skipping two meals. Like I can be in a meeting and I have brain fog and I don't know what I want to do and I don't care what we're trying to achieve because all I want is a cheeseburger. Like it's amazing how instantly weak and useless and controlled I am by food. And in that moment, this is the cry of my heart, Father, I just want humility. I just want to be humble. I just want to be humble. Like, Lord, I recognize that I think I know everything, and I think I know the answer, and I recognize I don't. And so would you give me strength, and would you give me uh, humility, Lord? I just, I, I'm aware today I am weak, and I need you. It's amazing how it puts everything in perspective. And the people who would normally bug the life out of me, when they bug the life out of me, it's like the greatest gift because I realized that my reaction stinks, not their behavior. On any other given day, when I'm full of cheeseburgers and french fries, and get out of my way, I'm busy doing stuff. I'm awesome for the kingdom, you know? And thinking I'm right, and thinking they suck. But when you fast, you're just like, oh, Lord, I remember that you said you want me more like that than this, and I'm so sorry, I completely forget. Can I be a little bit um, transparent? One of the things I'm, the two things, the Lord, the, uh, I forget when it was, a couple of months ago, he said to me, Alan, what is it you would like me to do for you? And I said, Lord, I, I would really like influence and I'd really like wealth. And now here, this, that sounds, well, I'm not even gonna apologize for that. It's been a long journey for me. And so the Lord said, that's great. I'd be happy to do those two things for you. He said, would you like to know what the counterbalance for those two things are so you don't go off the rails? And I was like, what's that? And he's like, wisdom 
and humility. He said, without wisdom and humility, wealth and influence will just topside you. And he said, I actually love you so much that I'd hate to give you something that would spoil you. So would you like some wisdom? I'd, I'd love it. He said, here's how you get wisdom. You just ask me for it. Because in, in, in James it says, I would, you know, I'll give wisdom to anyone who asks for it. Most people forget to ask for it. Proverbs 3 verse 5 says, lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge God. The trouble is when you get used to your ways, you forget that you need God. I'm kind of awesome. Like, look how far I've got. It's amazing. It worked for me yesterday. It worked for me today. Oh, whoop, I just slipped. What happened? Oh, I forgot to acknowledge God in all my ways. He says, when you get influence, you get confused why people are listening to you. You think that people are listening to you because you're awesome. No, 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 you're just a reflection of someone who's awesome. The way you stop going off the cliff on that one is you have humility. There's only two ways you get humility is God humbles you, which he, is his last choice. He really doesn't want to do that. Or you humble yourself. In Scripture, it talks about how you, know, you can either fall on the rock, which is Jesus. You can yield to him or the rock falls on you. I honestly think that my breakdown that I talked about last week in, when I was 21 years old was the Lord humbling me. I really do. I think I was so filled with pride and arrogance. I remember my two closest friends at the time um, sitting down with me, and they loved me enough to have this horribly painful conversation before we even knew what powerful communication was. They sat me down and they just said, Alan, we love you, and we see you behaving in ways that we think if you knew how you were behaving, you would be appalled. So I did what any good Christian said. I would say, I will pray about that. Thank you for bringing that to my attention, you big jerks. Okay. <laughs> Like on the outside, you're like, oh, yes, bless you. I will pray about it on the inside. You're like, Lord, who do they think they are? They don't even know well, what about this and this and that. Blah, blah, blah. And so, <coughs> of course, I prayed about it and decided that they were deceived and knew nothing. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, I go work for somebody uh, who was just an ogre and just... And in my process of working for him, I realized, oh, I'm working for a mirror image of myself. And I think about three months into working with this person, I went back to my friends and said, you know how you try to confront me on this thing and I never saw it? Well, I got the message loud and clear. There's something wonderful. You know, when I'm not an expert on humility at all, I'm, 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 I've purposed in my heart that in this season, you know, I've gone through a bunch of seasons in my life where I've wanted to learn everything about the prophetic and learn everything about healing, and I love all that stuff. But what I want to learn about is wisdom and humility. That's really, that's what my heart is drawn for. I have got so many heroes of the faith. Do you know the person who, who most astonishes me is Sapraza? When Sapraza's here, I'm like, oh, how do you, how do you, how are you that awesome? And I would say that his awesomeness is in counterbalance with his humility. And uh, so anyway, sorry, I got a little bit of sidetrack there. But I don't know a faster way to bring yourself to a place where you can feel the pleasure of the Lord because you and him both know that you're weak than fasting. Let me give some practical steps on how to fast. I would like to just suggest, first and foremost, use wisdom on this. Fasting is always voluntary, right? So yes, Jeff has called the church to a three-day fast. You get to choose whether you're going to be in that fast. It's awesome. You also get to choose what you're fasting. I would say that if you have historically had a problem abusing food, I would suggest you don't fast. So you get some good measures of healing for that, and you've got some great accountability, because the, uh, the opportunity to, be, to exchange dysfunction for quote-unquote godliness is too big a temptation. If you have never fasted before, now you can fast anything. You can fast negativity, you can fast Facebook, you can fast... Um, right now, I'm on a, a, a heroin and cocaine fast. I'm just not fasting at all, which is just awesome, which is amazing. Uh, and exercise, okay, I'm just fasting. I think it was an idol in my life, to be honest. But no, you can fast anything. Here, what I'm talking about when I say practical steps, I'm talking about fasting food, okay? So in Scripture, you see people fasting. And there's a couple of different fasts there, but here's my beginner's fast for you. If you have never fasted food before, then here's your simple baby step, is when you wake up in the morning, don't eat. I know it's radical, but that's the way you start fasting. <laughs> so skip breakfast, right? Go straight for lunch. Just practice that. 
right? Just see if you can do that. If you can handle that, then what I would really suggest doing is an intermediate fast. Skip, wake up, skip breakfast, skip lunch, and eat dinner, right? Try not to kill yourself, because usually by the time you get to like five o'clock, that counts as dinner time. All right, I'm going to have six Big Macs, please, like four fries, and yes, of course, I want to supersize them. Okay, and I want a banana strawberry milkshake, and that's not going to be helpful for you. But just try and skip your two, your breakfast and your lunch and your dinner and go to sleep. And well done, you've actually done a good fast. You've, you've almost done 24 hours in that one. Then you can do a, a day fast. And I would start, suggest by building up to this, okay? And so you wake up in the morning and you don't eat anything till you wake up the next morning and you have something called break fast, right? I'll tell you what that will do. That will be fine if you've been practicing till dinner time. But from dinner time to bedtime, it's called the dark night of the soul. Okay? <laughs> That's when the spirits of Doritos, the spirit of Oreo, two evil principalities called Ben and Jerry will haunt you. Okay? And you're like, yeah, oh, God's not religious. It doesn't matter. We can just do it. You know, <clears throat> my number one rule in fasting is if you're going to fast, Decide how long before you start fasting. Ten minutes should do it. Okay, we're done. <laughs> Seriously, if you're going to fast, just say, Holy Spirit. Uh, and sometimes you can volunteer a fast. You can just say, Lord, I'd like to try this. Would you give me grace for it? If he's not saying, but you'd like to try it, just say, hey, God, would you give me grace? I try and fast on, I try and find a balance between a day that's not overwhelmingly busy, right? Like when a school starts up in September, Mondays and Tuesdays are a write-off, a complete write-off. From the moment I wake up, like a Monday, I basically get to church and I teach six times and then do m and and go home at 11. It would be stupid for me to fast then because people would be like, hey, Alan, what do you want? You know? <laughs> okay, somebody get my Snickers. There we go, fine again. But, so I try and counterbalance a day that is not insanely busy but with a day that's moderately busy so the time passes faster. Right? I also try and not do it on days that I'm meeting with people because that's just awkward. You know, sitting in a restaurant. No, no, you order. I'm fasting. <laughs> Behold my halo. Okay? So, you know, just trying to fit it in with your life there. Then there's a Daniel fast. You know, in Daniel chapter 1, it talks about Daniel being taken into captivity. And he lived in the king's house. Can you imagine all the, um, in the palace, sorry. Can you imagine all the food that was available to him? But he said, no, 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 we're just going to eat fruit and vegetables. All you vegetarians, high five yourself. You've been fasting for years. All right? But, you know, sometimes there's a dying fast there where you only eat fruit and vegetables. Later in Daniel, I forget which chapter it was, where he talked about not eating uh, meat or any choice foods or any wine. Again, most people think that was just fruit, vegetables, nuts. Um, and, you know, that's an easy one to do an extended fast if you're looking um, to do an extended fast. There um, is a juice fast which is really, really good. Especially, like if you're doing a beginner's fast or even an intermediate fast and your body's not used to fasting, you don't want to freak it out. So maybe just juice some stuff and drink that. Um, the two most helpful books that I have read on this topic is Mahesh Chav does The Hidden Power of Prayer and Fasting. I honestly didn't believe the stories in there. I forget how many 40-day fasts he's done. Something like 21 40-day fasts. Now it's jacked as metabolism. Okay, and he'll, he'll tell you that himself. But the stories in there, I, again, had never heard of it. Derek Prince wrote an amazing book called Shaping History Through Prayer and Fasting. But I think it is a not talked about kind of secret weapon in the kingdom that brings humility in our life and God's attracted to humility. Remember the disciples tried to cast out a demon and then uh, they couldn't do it and so Jesus comes along and hey presto, he cast out the demon. Probably didn't say he presto. Um, haven't checked the original Greek. But they come to him and said, well, how come you could do it? We couldn't. He said, oh, that kind of only comes out by prayer and fasting. So he's pointing to something that he'd built up something through just hidden prayer and hidden fasting with God that looked like power and authority. All right, whenever I teach on something like this, I always like to take questions because especially when I've uh, not really thoroughly prepared for it, there's stuff that I will have missed out that the Holy Spirit will want me to speak on, and usually that, finds, that comes by questioning. So does anybody have any questions about fasting? Your enthusiasm is overwhelming, so if you can just do one at a time, we have a question right there. 
But yeah, if you can come out to the aisle, that's more helpful. Would a, would a better way to describe fasting is probably just a, a real rest? Are you asking me a question or are you yes. making a statement? Is, uh, would, would calling fasting just be easier said as just a real rest? I Especially guess it's a if rest you're from for a day that's yeah. less stressed out. It, it doesn't feel like a rest to me. I feel, <laughs> it feels like, ah, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. But yes, there is a huge rest. Especially if you get through a day of fasting when you go to bed at night, there is something completely different going on. As somebody who, you know, fills himself up and then goes to bed and usually your stomach's like, to not have that, that kind of stillness and that quietness is, is amazing. I was sharing with our team earlier that I read an article in the Daily Telegraph where some researchers have found that doing a three-day fast completely reboots your immune system, which I was like, that's remarkable. A completely secular uh, study, but I thought, gosh, that's amazing. And uh, anyway, somebody else had a question. When you fast during those meal times, would you be praying, reading your words? So, like, what's practical advice? It's a great question. The... Thank you. Yeah, brilliant question. Um, when I uh, had a normal job and I would be fasting, yeah, when I was on my lunch break, I would go away, and which wouldn't be uncommon. You know, most people would leave and go and eat their food in the cafe or a restaurant. I'd go find an empty office and I would pray during that time. Nowadays, you know, with kids and everything, I'm usually preparing their meal. That's a lot of fun. Hmm, let me make you these deliciously horrible chicken nuggets and put them in front of you, and I won't eat any of them. Oh, God, do you see the suffering I'm enduring for the sake of the cross? All right? So, <clears throat> again, sometimes on my day, whenever I, you know, the, it's one of the benefits of fasting is you have an internal clock that's like, rah, rah, rah. and so instead of satisfying that with food, you just say, Holy Spirit, I, I'm aware I'm weak. I need you. Holy Spirit, would you just come and would you just do amazing things? You know how you've got your friend who's uh, sick or you've got a situation going on and you say you'll pray for them and you mean that, but then you forget because you get on the rest of your life. When you're fasting, there's just this constant reminder, oh yeah, Lord, I'm just praying for so-and-so and like, would you just bring... So yes and no, depending on, my, depending on my schedule. Again, I think the beauty, I'm amazed at the simplicity and the genius of God that fasting, you literally do nothing. Like I laugh, I'm just like, God, I don't understand how this works. You add increase to me by doing nothing. Like what, what, who comes up with this stuff? It's amazing. So, but yeah, prayer and fasting. Like if you think about Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday that we're doing with the church. So here's a really funny thing. Jeff announces it. We're going to do a fast Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Our youth pastors put up their hand. Brett and Sharon are like, ah, oh, Jeff, we organized like a barbecue for all our youth leaders and parents. And I love Jeff's response. Jeff's response was, then have the barbecue in the middle of the vast. It's like, it's totally fine. Like, we're just putting this out there. There's flexibility in it. And I just thought that's amazing. We're going away with our team, uh, you know, on Thursday. And so that's, you know, the last day of the fast. I have, I have no problem with that. All right. So I think if you find life in something, it's so much easier to do it. Is that helpful? Okay. Sorry. Mr. Chris. My question is, Alan, uh, I have done some prayer and fasting, but what's the best way to come back on? Because the, the last few times I've fasted yeah. for three or four days, I come back on and I literally ate like five cheeseburgers and that was just not good. Or yeah. you know what I mean? Or just like, how do you, how did you, how did you go back on after doing I would say five fast? cheeseburgers excessive four is probably about the right number. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> One cheeseburger for every day that you've been fasting is my rule of thumb. <laughs> There is, you know, in Scripture it talks about the Holy of Holies in the New Jerusalem. I think that's called steak and shake, okay? So you just go, I'll just have the left hand side of the menu, please. And No, you're absolutely right. If you're doing a day fast, uh, here's the thing. If you haven't been eating all day, I would not advise that you eat KFC. I would not advise you eat KFC any time of the day. But like eating fried food on an empty stomach is not going to be helpful. But if you're, you know, your body's used to a certain diet, a certain way you eat, I think you can safely skip breakfast and lunch and eat whatever you'd normally eat on dinner with absolutely no problem. If you're doing a more extended fast, even two days or three days without food, you're going to have to be really careful about how you reintroduce food. If you do a really, you know, a longer fast than that, um, your, um, your bowels tend to shut down, which can be uncomfortable when they start back up again. Um, and so I'm, I'll put a link, I'll tweet out a link from the Emanate thing. There's a brilliant guy that answers all those questions from IHOP, who know a thing or two about fasting. Uh, and they've written a very, very helpful guide about what to eat and how to prepare your body for a fast. And I don't know why I'm all uh, stuffed up, but yeah, I'll, I'll post that. But yeah, you absolutely need wisdom for breaking it. I like to start with, this is ludicrous. I mean, there's nothing worse than finishing a long fast where I'm like, oh, it's the day I can start eating. I think I'll have 
lettuce for breakfast. Like, <laughs> but you actually need more discipline breaking a fast than enduring a fast in, in, in my experience. So yeah, let me tweet out a link and you can follow that. Um, okay, so I know some women who have, while pregnant or breastfeeding, done oh. fasts, and others who have not. What are your thoughts? Okay, you do not fast when you are pregnant or... Uh, seriously, let's just use some wisdom. So you do not... I mean, you can fast looking at your iPhone. That's a much better fast. So do not fast if you're pregnant or if you're breastfeeding. No. Right? Absolutely do not do that. If you feel guilted into doing something, that's not the Holy Spirit. Do you know what I mean? If you're feeling pressure, that's not how the Holy Spirit operates. He operates through cooperation. And of course, willing obedience. Um, yeah, nowhere in Scripture does it say for children to fast. Um, so I use that verse kind of like, well, I'm just childlike in the kingdom, so I don't need to fast. So, yeah. Does that help? Good. Any other questions? Is there someone here? Here you are. Sorry, I didn't see you. Here, do you want to stand up? <laughs> um, so I fasted before, but I feel like um, sometimes I'm hesitant to like fast again because I'm afraid my heart will be in the wrong um, mindset yeah. or whatever. So how do you make sure that you're not like in a striving mentality while you're fasting? That's a great question. Um, I think community. Like AJ, if AJ was here... I forget how many years she did this, but she would start the year every year with a 40-day fast, right? And she would say, you know, when I say that, people would be like, wow. She said, yeah, I thought that too. Wow, look at a spiritual giant. She said, but it was nothing more than a hunger, a hunger strike to try and twist God's arm into, you know, blessing me. And, you know, the Lord basically came. If you've heard her teach on Marthaplexy, the Lord basically just arrested her on that. Like, what are you doing? Like, wow, you wasted 40 days, you know? And so I think being in community and having other people call you going like, ah, it kind of feels like you're just being super religious right now. Or, hey, it kind of feels like you're in striving. Or the Holy Spirit's really good at that. Psalm 139, search me, God, know my heart. Um, so, yeah, I think having people around you that know you and love you and, uh, is really helpful. Yeah. Let's take one more question. Got a question over here. I started wearing glasses again after wearing contact lenses. Contact lenses never got smudgy or foggy. These are like, I can't see anybody. Hold on. Um, so I only know a little bit about what's going on in the Middle East, but I more want to know, like, if what perspective we're coming from in fasting for the Middle East. Like, I don't know, some things to pray for, some, yeah. like, Great. what the Lord says about it. Right. Um, I think if you, so I'll answer that from... Uh, a couple of viewpoints. So uh, we're told to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So the fasting part of that is a great reminder. You're just in your pang and your weakness. You're like, oh yes, Lord, I'm praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Because I can say tonight, hey guys, could you pray for Jerusalem this week? And you're like, yes, absolutely will. And I can get back here and go, how many guys prayed for Jerusalem? And you're like, ah, the spirit was willing, but the flesh was willing. I completely forgot. Angry Birds came out with a new game and you know, what am I going to do? Um, and, you know, it's just the frailty of, of flesh just being weak. So I think, you know, part of the thing of fasting is it's, you know, it's inbuilt alarm clock and a reminder. In Iraq, speaking to the bishop of Baghdad, he said, you know, I'm praying for three Ps, for protection, for provision, and for persistence, perseverance, right? Or peace, there's five Ps, okay? Because we're so awesome. So I think there's an element there where we're just praying, of course, for the peace of Jerusalem. Of course, we're praying for, you know, God just to intervene. Of course, we're praying for the protection of people who are being attacked and removed from their home. We're asking, you know, God, would your Holy Spirit come and bring wisdom? And I, I, I think that's the, the focus of where we're going as a church. It's like, okay, identifying with those who are suffering. Um, that's the verse, right? Yeah, I just couldn't remember off the top of my head. So it's just that place of, Lord, we're pushing pause on our life to remember those Christians and brothers and sisters who are in desperate need. Because if we were in that situation, it would just be so awesome to know that actually other people are praying for us. So I think it's just a simple thing of like, God, and I love your question, and Jeff yesterday morning was just like, I don't know what I'm doing. So the kind of sitting still and being paused or even fasting is like, God, we don't know what we're doing, so would you speak to us so we do know what we're doing? I would probably say is the, the main reason. Um, that help? Yeah. All right. 
Well, why don't we pray? And uh, start small. And again, you can fast anything you wish, but if you're going to fast food, hopefully that helps. Look uh, for the PDF from IHOP on Twitter, and we'll send that out. Lord Jesus, I thank you that your kingdom is so upside down that none of it makes sense, Lord, that you ask us to extend forgiveness to people who've just wronged us, <laughs> that you ask us to give, Lord, and it will be given to us, Lord. You ask that uh, we learn to die so that we may live. You ask us to not eat food, and somehow that changes stuff in our lives and in the world around us. And Lord, we just say that we recognize that our thoughts are not your thoughts, and our ways are not your ways. And we want to be people who are childlike and learn from you, Lord. We want to remind ourselves that you're God and we're not. And so, Lord, as a people, Lord, we just purpose in our heart to be childlike, to not think we know everything and just to learn from you. And so, Lord, I ask that you would uh, really minister to people, Lord, who've been beat up and abused by churches that have been controlling or manipulative and have said that you have to do this and that and the next thing. Lord, that you would lift that off and that you'd help restore to us, Lord, this secret um, of hiddenness in you, Lord, of, of secret prayer and of secret giving and of secret fasting, and that you would um, really encourage our hearts, Lord, that you are for us, that you're not against us, and would we be a people who are uncommon in our passion for you and who are um, refreshingly meek, Lord, and that when you come and when you uh, bring your presence, like we know you will, Lord, that we... Don't try to own it or claim it, but Lord, we're just happy to pass it on to all who are hungry. And so, Lord, I just bless our um, church leaders. We just bless Jeff and Becky tonight, Lord, as they're leading us and as they're praying and as they're seeking uh, your way, Lord. Would you give them wisdom? Would you give us clarity, Lord? We pray for everybody in Iraq right now, Lord, that there would be peace, Lord. I pray for radical salvation of the terrorist leaders, Lord, that you would meet them in a dream, in a vision, that you would arrest their hearts like you did with Saul. Lord, I pray for peace in Jerusalem. Lord, I pray for um, supernatural resources to come to all who are in need, Lord, and I ask that you would bring refreshment to us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we have a ministry team who would love to pray for you, and they've been fasting for two weeks, so their anointing is so strong. You guys were fasting, right, for two weeks, you got the memo. But they would love to pray for you tonight. If you would like prayer for anything, uh, they will be standing behind me shortly. If you'd like to come over here, um, you can ensure that we will direct you to someone who can pray for you. Amanda's going to look after you in that respect. But thank you so much for being here. We will um, be here next week. I'm trying to think if anybody's speaking next week. Who? Someone probably is speaking. Yeah, it's either me or AJ. If AJ's next, they'll sort me again, but at least I'll have a week to prepare. All right, bless you guys. Have a great night, and we will see you next week.